Thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's uh, raining a little bit, so it's quite uh, uh, difficult for people to come. And I'm really happy for all of you who are here. And uh, I am pleased to present our Sysmore seminar of today. Uh, I am uh, Ada Taga Cohen, the director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Study of the Monotheistic Religions, and I'm happy to start. Um, today, we are uh, very happy to have with us Professor uh, Mordechai or Moti uh, Zalkin, who is uh, visiting. Kyoto from Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. Um, let me present him uh, in short. Professor Zalkin has received his degrees, BA, MA, and PhD in the field of Jewish history and education from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. From 2000, he started his position at the Department of Jewish History at Ben-Gurion University. Uh, as well as teaching and research work, he has held different academic administrative positions at the university, such as the chair of the Department of Jewish History at Ben-Gurion University and as a member of the University Senate and there are other uh, many uh, tasks that he has taken upon himself during his um, long career at the university. He has been involved and advised the national education committees. In his academic research, he was uh, visiting professor at several universities around the world, among them Harvard University in 2008, and the New York University in the academic year of uh, 2012 to uh, 2012 to 2013. Uh, in his publications, he has authored seven books on East European Jewish communities and a large number of articles and book chapters. Today, he will present us with his research on Dvora Rome, a Jewish woman of the 19th century who had turned her family publishing house into one of the largest in Europe. The title of his talk today is, as we can see, Dvora Rome, a cultural agent and marketing genius in 19th century Europe. Professor Zalkin, please. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Cohen, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's quite an experience to be in Kyoto. <laughs> and I'm um, uh, in today's talk. Would you mind if I'll stand? It's okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, all these you microphones. Are, but we need you. Yeah. Well, now I try. Yeah. That will be better. <laughs> I feel much safer this way. Um, could you turn off the lights here? Uh, <coughs> in today's uh, talk, oh, today's talk is uh, sort of uh, a cross crossroad or a mythic point between cultural history, social history, and gender history. And I would like to take you all with me for uh, the period of this lecture to a place which is far, far away from, from Kyoto, uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe, a town which was known to almost every Jew uh, in the, obviously in the, in the 19th century. Uh, this time is known as, uh, in Hebrew and Yiddish, is Vilna, uh, in, in Lithuanian, it is in Lithuania. It's Vilnius, which is today's uh, the capital of Lithuania, in Polish, it's uh, Vilno, in Russian it's Vilna. So uh, uh, this uh, town and city or city was quite uh, famous within uh, the Jewish people. By these times, and I'll come later on and explain 
why uh, this city gained uh, this um, sort of uh, famous, being famous among Jews all over the world. Um, there is, a, uh, in history, in general, there is a high correlation or po positive correlation between uh, a place being uh, a center of learning and knowledge and uh, being a center of printing and publishing. And uh, we, if we think about, you know, European history, I can uh, mention places like, or s uh, towns like, or cities like uh, Venice, uh, Amsterdam, uh, um, the Krakow in, in Poland, cities and towns in which, uh, or which were centers of knowledge and learning. And at the same time, obviously, there were uh, centers of publishing and printing. So there were printing houses in all, different, uh, all these different uh, towns and cities. However, Vilna, and uh, for tonight evening, uh, for tonight lecture, I'll use the Hebrew, the Hebrew version of the, uh, of the name of this uh, town. Vilna was an exception. On the one hand, since the beginning of the 18th century at least, Vilna was the most important uh, uh, center regarding uh, Jewish studies or canonic studies or re re religious studies all over the Jewish world much more important than Krakow in Poland, much more important than Amsterdam in, in, in Holland, much more important uh, than all you know, Italian uh, towns and cities, and so on and so forth. However, there was not even one Jewish printing and publishing house in this town or in this city uh, by this time. And uh, uh, as you see, this is Vilnius, uh, Vilna, the Jewish quarter. Uh, this uh, photo, or this uh, photo, was taken in the interwar period between the two world wars, um, by the beginning of the 1930s. But uh, this, it, uh, in a way, represents the very essence of this town, of this city, mainly of the Jewish quarter, which was located at the very heart of the ancient uh, 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 part of uh, Vilna or Vilnius or Vilno, and. Um, most of the people which you see here are obviously uh, Jews. So the, the vast majority of the population, of the Jewish population of this town and city, uh, uh, they were quite poor people. However, there were a thin stratum of Jewish families which were very rich or very well-to-do. And among them, there were the, uh, the, the, fam the famous, well-known, obviously, to people who are uh, you know, involved in this field, uh, the Rome family, the Strachon family, and some other families, the Finn family, some other families which were quite rich and famous uh, uh, during this time. Now, however, uh, by the beginning of the 19th century, uh, books, Jewish books, or canonic Jewish books, were obviously printed in this area, uh, uh, and as well as in, uh, in Vilna. What you can see here are some examples, for instance, um, this, uh, this one was printed in Vilna by the year uh, 1810. This one was printed in Minsk. Minsk is the capital of Belarus, Belarus in Russian, uh, <laughs> by the year uh, uh, 1820. And this was printed in, uh, in Vilna by the year uh, 1860. But what you can see here is sort of a development from a very a uh, simple, I would say, even primitive way of printing, design, and so on and so forth, to something which is much more uh, uh, sophisticated, well-designed, and, uh, uh, which, and much more uh, um, 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 interesting and uh, uh, attractive to the reader, to, to people who are interested in buying and reading books. All three uh, examples here are this, uh, these two are tractates from the Babylonian Talmud. This is uh, tractate Baba Kama. This is uh, Shkalim. And this is, uh, not, uh, th this is about an, uh, sort of um, a book about the, uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, Jewish uh, um, mystics or Kabbalistic books about the Zohar. Um, however, thinking about the uh, distribution or number of copies which are printed of, of all three together, uh, I can assume 
It was about a few hundreds, all in all. And um, here you see another example, very interesting example. Um, this is a, a, a very unique book, small one, uh, known as, I mean, the title is uh, Kundes. Kundes uh, uh, is a um, prank, prankster. Prankster is a, uh, a young boy who is very uh, sharp and uh, sophisticated. And uh, this, uh, this book is, well, is about, sort of a, a book about uh, Jewish boys and their life in uh, early 19th century Vilna. And what you see here is, it's, this is in Hebrew, and this is in Polish, because Vilna by this time, the vast majority of the population in Vilna were neither Russians nor Lithuanians, but just Jews and Pol and Pol and uh, Poles. And you see here, it's Vilna. This is the uh, Polish uh, uh, way. And this was printed by a very small printing house uh, um, owned by some Jewish guy. Ber a name, his name was uh, Berke Neumann, 1824. But again, pay attention to the uh, quality. It is a very simple, I would say, even very basic. Sorry, very, very basic. And, uh, how, and then, um, by the, sorry, by the year 1802, 1802, 1802, three Jewish printers, young Jewish printers, moved from Belarusia to Lithuania, from uh, Minsk to Vilna, thinking about the possibility of establishing a Jewish printing house in Vilna. And it, it was very, uh, um, I would say, common, uh, common way of thought. Since Vilna, as I said, was one of the biggest Jewish centers all over the world, all over, obviously, Eastern Europe, and Vilna was a center of Jewish learning. There were so many scholars. So uh, it was quite uh, uh, obvious that if they will be able to establish uh, a Jewish printing house there, they will have a great market and uh, so many consumers and so on and so forth. One of these three guys, his name was uh, uh, Manes Rom, and he established this uh, printing house in the year 1802. And um, they were quite successful. However, you see copies printed in the Rome printing house uh, uh, in, in the year 1849. There were about 40,000 all in all copies, not titles, copies. And most of these copies were of, you know, uh, basic, uh, I would say, I would call them Jewish uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, religious books, such as, you know, the prayer books and the, the uh, um, Pentateuch and so on and so forth. Later on, you see 1856, a little bit more, and then 1859, uh, a little bit more than 100,000, which seems quite many. However, thinking about it, I mean, during this year, only in Vilna, the Jewish population constituted about uh, 45,000 Jews. And this uh, printing house uh, uh, served a population, Jewish population of, I would say, around half a million Jews all around. So about 110 or 110,000 yeah, uh, co copies is a very small uh, number, not, not that much uh, significant. And then what was happening is that by, this, uh, by, the year, by the year 1860, the owner of the print, this printing house uh, all of a sudden passed away. He died. His name was David Rome, uh, and uh, um, he was the owner. And his widow, Deborah, she was about 26 years old. She had five children. And she obviously knew nothing about printing. Uh, she herself uh, uh, was born to a very affluent, very rich Jewish family. And then she married David Rome, also a son of a very rich uh, Jewish family. So she didn't have to worry about, you know, uh, financial, uh, you know, aspects of life or, or issues or to work for, I mean, uh, I mean, even one day of her life. And all of a sudden, her husband died. Now, yet they had enough uh, financial sources, I mean, this family, that they, should, they could either sell the printing and publishing house or uh, they could hire some other, you know, guy to uh, run the place. 
However, she decided to take it upon herself, which was by, by this time was a very, very, I would call it courage or courageous, you know, uh, uh, decision. Please do remember that by this time, Jewish uh, society was not uh, sort of an equal society. Women were not equal to men. And uh, running such an enterprise, uh, which was a very complicated uh, issue, was, I mean, something which was very unique, that such an issue, such a, a, um, an enterprise, publishing and printing house, running or headed by a Jewish woman, nobody ever heard about you know, such a, a phenomenon. But she was courageous, and you can see it in her face, don't you? As you see, she was born in 1831. She passed away in the year 1904. And within less than two months following the death of her husband, she established herself as the general director and the general manager of this printing and publishing house. And. Um, Almost immediately, she uh, uh, sketched a strategic plan how to make this, well, proportionally quite small printing and publishing house to something which was, uh, I mean, according to her ideas, dreams, and, and plans, would become a, a big uh, uh, printing and publishing house. So her first uh, uh, step was to appoint a professional printing manager. And she did it, uh, how she did it? She was looking, she looked around, she heard about some very professional uh, a printer, Jewish printer, in a small town in northern Lithuania. Uh, she called him to Vilna, and according to his memoirs, uh, he could, I mean, her offer, her financial offer to him was what we call irresistible. So she, she offered him, I don't, I don't remember, I mean, the figures, but uh, obviously he, he couldn't resist. And then he moved to Vilna, and immediately he became the professional manager of this publishing and printing house. And please do remember that up until this very moment, there was not such a division between professional manager, a marketing manager, financial manager. You know, firms were headed traditionally, obviously in this area, in the Russian Empire, by one person obviously men, and uh, this was, even this step was considered as so, sort of a revolution. She herself, she appointed herself as the general director, but uh, knowing that she knows nothing about printing, so she hired this guy. Uh, secondly, appointing a qualified business manager. And this was no other than her father, which was a very successful businessman, so she hired him. She paid him salary, but uh, since we have the agreement, there was a signed agreement between her and her father. And uh, in this agreement, in this contract, it is mentioned explicitly that he will not interfere in any other aspect than the uh, business uh, 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 managing. Uh, third, solving the family conflict by arbitration. When her husband died, he already had two brothers. So they were partners. And when he died, the other two, uh, two brothers were sure that one of them would become the general manager. However, as I said, she took a uh, few, uh, I would, as I said, courageous steps, and she became the general director or the general manager. And they were, her uh, brothers-in-law uh, were very annoyed with her and they threatened her of, you know, leaving the, the uh, uh, enterprise and establishing their own, uh, uh, you know, printing and, and publishing houses, so on and so forth. So she convinced them to bring here to, to bring the, the issue into an arbitration. They divided the assets of the family, and all of a sudden, somehow, I don't know how she made it, she got 60% of the entire assets, and they both got 40%. And um, the fourth uh, step was the printing house as an independent economic, economic entity. And this was another revolution. Until this very moment, 
there was no separation, I mean, financially speaking, between the family who owned this enterprise and the business itself. Am I clear? I mean, the money was, um, you know, uh, the same money. Nobody all around the Russian Empire was thinking about, you know, a separation between uh, your own assets, your own fortune, your own money, and the assets of the business which you run. And uh, she was the first, almost the first one, most probably the first one, to establish such a system in the Russian economic system. And um, she was, um, I must say, uh, 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 going through uh, the documents, uh, uh, it seems to me that she was, um, as a, I mean, that's part of uh, the title of my lecture today, I mentioned marketing genius. She was not only a marketing genius, she was also, as far as I see it, sort of a financial genius. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not a banker, I'm not a, fan, I mean, I know very little about uh, finance. But let me give you an example. Since the uh, 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 printing and publishing house uh, assets were totally different between the fam uh, and from the family's assets, and there was sort of a firewall between both, in a certain point of time, the uh, uh, printing and publishing house needed some extra money, some loans, in order to uh, promote uh, new projects. So what, what was happening, in, instead of taking those loans from some bank, she herself uh, 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 gave the money to the printing and, and publishing house, but for a very high interest. And um, so uh, in this way, you can, you can see, I mean, how clever she was. Uh, one word about sources. In the Russian Empire, but by this time, uh, a bureaucracy was something which we can, highly, which we can uh, hardly imagine. Each and every piece of paper had to be kept and preserved by law. So, hundreds of not hundreds, millions of papers, documents, were kept and preserved later on in archives. So, for, for you know, for bureaucrats and so on and so forth, it was sort of a, I would say very hard work or a disaster. For us historians, it is a paradise. It is a paradise. Uh, as odd as it sounds. So uh, today, when I research this uh, project, me and my students, we have a research group, uh, we can go through hundreds of thousands of documents and we can, you know, just follow this lady step by step, step by step. Okay, the next uh, um, step was, or principle, maintaining profitable policy. This was a very important uh, policy, I mean, uh, uh, aspect of, of her and managing this publishing and, and, and printing house. That each and every project must be profitable. She never ever printed a book which was not profitable. And if I, want, if I was an, an author, and some authors which you know very well made their first steps uh, with this lady, when they came with the manuscripts, she said to them, okay, fine, fair enough. If you want me to publish this book, you must finance it. It's up to you. Bring the money, I'll publish it, but the profit would be mine, not yours. Uh, quite a clever way. Six, close business relationships with, local, with the local censor. In the Russian Empire by this time, each and every book and pamphlet which was uh, printed and published, had to go through the censorship. Russia, by this time, was not a democracy, you know? It was an autocracy. So she established a very good relationships with the local censor. That means that uh, in more than one case, he just turned his eyes, you know, to the other way. So she managed to uh, publish all different uh, books and uh, pamphlets, which wouldn't be able to be published uh, I, I mean, without this uh, sort of a good relationship with the, with the sensor. Uh, production process according to, the, to a defined uh, uh, schedule. She was, you know, when you uh, 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 have in your mind the idea of publishing a book, those of us who 
ever published a book know that it is almost impossible to set a definite time for the publishing date, isn't it? I mean, you know, you have your manuscript and then you give it to the publisher and then, you know, reviews and so on. And then, you know, my, some, you know, uh, uh, the printing and the editing and so on and so forth. According to her uh, policy, when she got a manuscript and decided to, to publish it, she set a definite time. And uh, once, I mean, in some cases she said it would be published and printed within exactly within a year or six months or two years, and she always managed to go through this uh, policy. Again, that means that she, qui she was quite, uh, I would say, um, 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 not only courageous manager, but very strict one. Uh, aggressive competition with other printers and publishers. Let me give you an example. At the same point of time, her two brothers-in-law, you remember them, those two? They threatened, her, they, they decided that, that they leave uh, this enterprise and they established their own new publish and publishing and printing house. And they were professionals. Fine, fair enough. She said nothing. And then, um, after almost a year, uh, they published that within uh, a month, they are going to publish a new version of the uh, Torah, of the five, you know, of the Pentateuch, right? A uh, very uh, um, exclusive one, and so on and so forth, which would cost a certain amount of money. And they invested in this uh, uh, um, uh, edition all the fortune which they had. One week before they published their uh, version, their, their, their edition, she published her own edition, new edition, but with half a price. And then they uh, got bankrupt, and they begged her to join back, you know, this uh, uh, enterprise. So you see here again this very brave and you know courageous and uh, I would say uh, uh, interesting lady. Recruitment and uh, retention of professional employees. This printing and publishing house employed uh, 10 years after she uh, <coughs> became the manager, about 600 employees, 600. This was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, Jewish economic enterprise all over Europe, and one of the, of the biggest all over Russia. 600 employees, you know, printers, uh, uh, um, um, editors, book binders, marketing uh, you know, managers, and so on and so forth. Salesmen, and so on and so forth. And uh, during all the years which, we, which she was the manager of this printing and publishing house, never ever they got on strike. She managed a very good relationships with her, with, with, the, with the her employees. So both sides were happy. The uh, salaries in this uh, printing and publishing house was quite high this time. And um, therefore, they were happy, she was happy, and this contributed a lot to this uh, printing and publishing house. So this is the strategic plan, the organization and business. Strategic plan, printing, modernization of the printing process. She was the first one all over Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe, I mean Russia, Poland, the Ukraine, Belarus, and so on and so forth, to introduce a new technique of printing, which was known by this time as a stereotype uh, 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 technique. What I mean, previous to this uh, uh, technique, you know how uh, people printed books in, uh, I mean, pr previous to, to this time? You had this, uh, what, what they call, uh, uh, metrics, metrics by uh, um, metal metrics. Each one was of one letter, and some and, and the people you know and, and one of the people who worked for her you know put each and every letter, each and every letter, uh, and then he formed a word and then a line and so on and so forth, which was a lot of work to do. And when you uh, completed a, a book and you printed it, you dismantle 
these frames in order to reuse the letters, the single letters, which was a lot of work and a lot of time consuming and so on and so forth. And then a German engineer uh, <coughs> um, invented a new type, which uh, the, the idea was that after you uh, form this you know, type of, of, of a page with all the letters and, and words and lines, you put on it some soft material. And you raised it, and it became uh, uh, quite uh, uh, um, what's um, what's the word? In, uh, dry. And then you could use it as a negative. You understand what I mean? For future additions. So she was the first one uh, in all, all of Western Europe to introduce this this new technique, which gave her, you know, I mean, uh, then. By this, only by this step, she almost totally dominated the uh, Jewish printing market. Then, extensive use of original manuscripts. She insisted of printing the most, prob uh, most possible uh, uh, original manuscripts. When we talk about Jewish manuscripts, Jewish uh, uh, texts, you know, so many Jewish texts were uh, uh, underwent sort of a censorship. Uh, of the church during, during medieval times. So when she uh, uh, decided to print some book which went under you know, uh, uh, um, some Christian uh, uh, censorship, she sent experts to some archives and libraries all over Europe, mainly to the Vatican, to buy, buy the originals. And she invested fortune. You know, it was not that easy to buy original uh, manuscripts from, from, from the Vatican. And she brought, they, they, they were brought to Vilna, and they used only original manuscripts. Um, top level proofreading. She employed the uh, most professional uh, Hebrew readers of the time. This was a generation of Jewish authors preceded uh, Agnon and the others, I mean, uh, people like Adama Cohen and uh, Yalag Yudalib Gordon, all these people who were experts of Hebrew, and she employed them as uh, uh, proofreaders, using the most modern typography, we'll see in a minute, and original and unique font, Vilna. She uh, uh, employed uh, some guy who was professional in uh, 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 forming or designing uh, fonts. And there is a font, unique font Vilna, which still exists. And you can find it in, the, uh, uh, in Word today, Word um, application, right? You can see the Vilna. And uh, it was used from the moment this uh, uh, font was designed, each and every book which was printed in this printing house was printed in this font. And it's so, so it became sort of a of her, um, you know, um, um, I mean, everybody, I mean, if you, if you looked at the book and you saw this Vilna, you would show that it was printed in this uh, printing house. Marketing, developing new literary genres. She did not print only, you know, uh, canonic uh, Jewish literature, the Pentateuch and the, the, the Talmud and the Mishnah and so on and so forth. She was the first one to print, I mean, in massively, all new Jewish modern literature. Um, to mention some names, Abraham Mapu, I mean the founding father of modern Jewish literature. Abraham Mapu, Adama Cohen, Michal, Yudalib Gordon, and so on and so forth. Um, constant adv advertising. And this was another, I would say, uh, genius step. Since 1860, Jewish uh, newspapers were published all over Eastern Europe, all over Eastern Europe, mainly in Hebrew, very few in Yiddish. She was the first one to understand the very essence of modern media, I mean, among, within the Jewish world, all over the Jewish world. And she constantly published her, you know, uh, film and her new editions and so, so on and so forth. We'll see it in a minute, 
uh, in all these different new newspapers. So, you know, using uh, the media in such an extensive uh, uh, um, 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 way was a very new to the entire Jewish world. Almost nobody, almost nobody did it beforehand. Distribution through agents in Europe and America. She developed a huge network of marketing. She had agents in Poland, in Germany. Uh, this project, which we run now, about their own printing house, is in cooperation with uh, the Dubnov Institute in Leipzig, Germany. And in Leipzig, which was the, the, the most important marketing, uh, book marketing city in Europe, she had, she had already two agents who uh, distributed her, her books. But not only in, in Germany, in Italy, in England, in France, in America. And this is very early. And obviously, in the uh, Middle East, in Iraq, in Baghdad, in Palestine, and in some other, in, in Egypt, in Northern Africa. Um, and then different quality type versions of each edition. She was very well aware of the uh, uh, you know, financial uh, uh, hardships of so many Jews around the world. So, so she was thinking about a way uh, that would enable those you know, people who are not very affluent and did not have enough money uh, to buy her books as well. How did she, how did she do it? She published different quality type versions of each edition. Let me give you an example. When she published her, what we call the flagship project, the new uh, uh, edition of the Babylonian Talmud, which I'll come to it in a few minutes, uh, she published it in a three different quality types. There was a very high quality type for rich people. There was a quality type for middle class people. And there was a, a type, quality type for poor people. For instance, the uh, lower type was unbounded. So you bought just the, the you know, uh, a bunch of, of papers. And it was printed on a very simple paper. So, um, and by this way, in a way, she dominated the entire Jewish marketing, market, uh, uh, book, book uh, market. Well, you see the building. This is a huge building. You see just part of it. However, uh, during her uh, time as a manager, the entire street until here was belonged to her and to the publishing house. And uh, this building uh, is one of the biggest and the most massive buildings in uh, the city of Vilna up till today. Up till today. You know, it's very interesting historically. She uh, built this, uh, this building for her own use. Later on, after her death, somebody else who bought the printing house used it. Later on, after World War I, it was uh, uh, again a printing house of a local printer. During World War II, it was the official printing house of the local Nazi party. And later on, after World War II, it was the official printing house of the local Communist Party. So printing houses you know, have this uh, character, you know, like schools and hospitals, that they serve you know, different types of, um, of political systems. But still, uh, it, it, it is very impressive. And um, talking about this lady as a genius, you know, Jewish society by this time was divided. There were intra-conflicts. Vilna was the center of the anti-Hasidic uh, movement all over Eastern Europe. The Jewish society was divided by the uh, Jews who were pro-Hasidic, mainly uh, you know, uh, in the Ukraine, but not only on the, in the Ukraine, and those who were anti-Hasidic. Uh, do I have to explain the very essence of Hasidism? No, I don't. However, what you see here, she printed a book which was written by one of the most famous Hasidic leaders, of the Chabad Lubavitch leader. Why? Just out of financial considerations. This book was very popular, and uh, she sold 
tens of thousands of copies of this book. You see here his name, Shneur Zalman. And uh, she, you know, for her, the only, uh, only criteria whether to publish a book or not was whether it is profitable or not. Now, she was one of the fierce anti-Hasidic people all over this area. However, at the same time, she was a businesswoman. And as a businesswoman, she published this book. I don't believe that she read even one page of this book, even though she mastered Hebrew, well, fluently, fluently. However, from the, her, you know, economic point of view or financial perspective, why not? Let print the book and uh, make some profit out of it. Some members of the professional staff. And this is a very small group of, of the professional staff. This is the only picture, the only photo which we have about the professional staff. It's black and white, so maybe they seem to you quite, uh, you know, unhappy. Mm -hmm. But when I read their memoirs and the letters, as I said, she was considered as, a, on the one hand, a very fierce and strict employer. On the other hand, as a very generous one. Very, very generous one. She knew personally each one of them. And it, uh, if any one of these, you know, uh, workers had some difficulties, you know, personal, uh, family, whatever, she immediately ordered her, you know, administration to support this guy uh, until he would be able to uh, return to, uh, to work. Well, this is one of the uh, uh, most inter interesting uh, uh, findings which we found. Catalog and price list. Uh, uh, constantly, they publish this publishing house. I mean, as part of her marketing uh, policy, she constantly published uh, catalogs. And in this catalog, you have, you see here, the title and um, the uh, prices, yeah? And there are prices for uh, agents and pri prices for private consumers. Yeah. You should probably point out the name of the printing house, yes? Yeah. At the bottom, yes? Yeah, I, I, I'll come to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, please, okay. I, I, not everybody. OK, so, so I'll, say, I'll say something now. Uh, she was known, I mean, her name was Deborah Rome, as you know. But she was never, this, her name was never mentioned in any of her books, but she was known as the widow. The widow and the brothers. Why the widow? Why, I mean, she was so famous. Everybody in Vilna knew that she was, her name was Dvora or Deborah. I mean, everybody knew her. She was, in a way, I must say, the queen of the city. She was so famous. Uh, so why? Uh, the answer is, is quite simple. Please do remember that we are talking about a conservative religious Jewish society. And since most of her books, the books which, which she published, were some of the canonic books, like the, uh, uh, you know, the Babylonian Talmud and so on and so forth, quite many uh, Orthodox Jews couldn't stand the idea that the name of a woman would be printed, you know, uh, in, the pipe, in the title page of, of, of the book. So from her point of view, it was not even a question. Fine, fair enough. Uh, why, why should I, you know, insist of, of uh, publishing, of printing my own name if I, if, if I can use, you know, my other name, the widow, and, I'll, uh, be, and the books will, will be sold in, my, in many more copies and it would be much more profitable. And, you know, up till today, I mean, well, she passed away by the year 1904. So in, in, in the Jewish world, I mean, in the Jewish Orthodox world, up till today, she's known as the widow. Very few people know her real name. Uh, but uh, thank you for your comment. So you see here, it is always the widow and the brothers. One more uh, following comment. How did I know? Uh, what was the very the first moment that she uh, um, became the, uh, the, the manager of this printing house? Uh, about a month following her husband's death, there was an ad, an advertisement, in one of the local Jewish uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, um, in, in this ad, the content was that we, the Rome family, 
we are very regret that our father has passed away and so on and so forth. And we promise you, our uh, customers, that we will continue uh, serving you for the years to come. But what, was, what is very interesting is the signature. The signature is uh, the widow, the almana, in font, let's say, uh, 40. And then the brothers in font 20. <laughs> you mean the size. And it was obvious who is the, uh, as we say in Hebrew, the balabite, or the balatabite. Um, and again, it was, I mean, if you, if you notice such, you know, uh, delicate issues, you can really understand what was behind the curtains. Um, printing machines in Jewish printing houses. What I want to present now is the scale of this pr printing house. So we see in the year 18, 1863. Here you can see four printing houses in, in Vilna. Just in Vilna. The Dvorzets, Rosencrantz, Finn, and Rome. You see the figures? The Rome owned 75% of the modern machines and 73% of the hand machines. That means that she dominated the market uh, exclusively. And this is only three years after the death of her husband. You can see it again in this uh, uh, chart, employees in Jewish printing houses in Vilna. Here you see a few more printing houses. A typograph, typograph, you know, it's uh, a typical name. Yeah. Mats, Dvorzets, there were two brothers, which obviously had the conflict, so they had two different printing houses. <coughs> Blumovich, Sirkin, Finn and Rosenkratz, and Rome. You see she, employed uh, um, um, seven, by this year 77 uh, uh, employees, which constitute about 59% of the entire Jews who were involved in the printing and publishing business. So you can, you can see here the scale. She managed to turn uh, a small, I would say small scale printing and publishing house into a huge uh, enterprise. Here are some examples of the uh, ads which she uh, advertised uh, constantly. Uh, here you can see this is an um, announcement from the uh, publishers, the sons of the Rome family. Uh, we uh, uh, announce to our agents, pay attention, in Austria, Hungary, Galicia, Galicia is part of the Ukraine, all major Jewish centers, so all, um, that all of all, all the books which we print, uh, we have now about 300 different titles and many more uh, uh, printed books which they did not print, but they uh, served as agents as marketing agents, and they are in the catalog. Uh, each one of, I mean, all, all of our agents can uh, buy uh, these uh, books in Lemberg, Lemberg, Lvov, Lviv, was the, uh, the capital of Galicia by this time, and uh, by these people, and so on and so forth. And here you see Vilna, the printers, the widow, and the brothers, their uh, address, it's in Yiddish here. And um, you see here, again, the names and the addresses. In, uh, and if you was interested in Yiddish, contemporary Yiddish, you can see here some examples. And here, uh, uh, they, this is a very interesting one, 1880. Uh, uh, they admit that they, they, they printed some prayer, prayer books, and there were some mistakes. So uh, she says, or they say, that um, um, we, we ask the rabbis and the leaders of the uh, synagogues uh, to uh, uh, publish it among the, the prayer people or the, their uh, congregation and so on and so forth. And this here, uh, again, they said about, I mean, this is about the Vilna Shas and one of, uh, of its uh, commentators that we already published, we already published four volumes and we will, uh, and, and about the Zohar as well, 
and we will continue our publishing. So as I said, she used the media extensively. You can hardly open, they can hardly open, Jew, I mean, every, any Jewish newspaper, newspaper all over Europe without finding an ad by the Rome Painting House. And it cost a lot of money. But she considered, uh, you know, advertisement as a part of promoting her businesses, which is a very modern way of thought, of economic way of thought. Now, the flagship project, a new edition of the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud, as you probably know, is the, the biggest and the most complicated Jewish book. Am I correct? I mean, the biggest one. Uh, consisting of 22 uh, uh, volumes. Uh, I don't remember how many pages, but it's more than 1,000 pages. And it is a very complicated project. By the year 1879, she decided to embark upon a, a project which was considered as um, you know, imaginary, to print and publish a new edition of the Babylonian Talmud. All of her advisors, her financial advisor, her uh, 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 printer's advisors, uh, uh, when there was a sort of a consultation, we have, well, I think it is the protocol. They uh, said more or less, in, in, in a very well-mannered ways, um, words, you are a lunatic. You are going to lose a, lo to lose a lot of money. I mean, you will never be able, never be able to go through this project. And you know what was her answer? She said, I'm going through it, and the last volume will be published by the eve of uh, the festival of Pesach of the year 1886. Now, you must be very courageous, you know, to publish such a, you know, a statement. And she published it. Secondly, she decided that, uh, let's go through the project plan, edition based on a rare and precise manuscript. And again, she sent three people to the Vatican. Three of them uh, uh, sat in the Vatican for six months. They couldn't buy manuscript, but they copied them. And they came back to Vilna. And this is the reason why uh, this uh, Babylonian edi ed, uh, Talmud edition, which is known as the Vilna Shas ever since, is considered up till today the most precise and the most reliable uh, 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 version or edition of the Babylonian Talmud. And this is all thanks to a lady. So for us, it's, well, obviously, what's the point? But for the people of the time, that the Jewish lady would run a project of publishing the Babylonian Talmud. It was, you know, mainly for Orthodox people. It was just uh, imaginary. Secondly, 100 commentators. Until this moment, the Babylonian Talmud was published uh, with about 20 to 30 commentators. She decided to expand it to 100 commentators. However, there is sort of a secret behind it. Because if you review the list of the other commentators, about 30 of them were rabbis, were, sorry, were local rabbis and heads of uh, yeshivas. That means, now, think, think about it, you know, economically. Those rabbis, at the moment they saw their own interpretation of the Talmud printed, obviously they would recommend it, you know, to everybody. And obviously the heads of the yeshivas they bought, you know, again and again, editions for their students. So she was just, um, you know, this is what I mean by saying that she was a um, marketing genius. Uh, luxury de design, fancy leather binding. She insisted of binding this uh, edition with the most expensive uh, leather, which made, I mean, you know, the uh, better quality type edition costed more than five times expensive than uh, any previous, sorry, edition of the Babylonian Talmud. And her financial, her financial advisor was very much against it. 
And she was so much, you know, uh, she insisted and she said, this is the way I understand marketing. And she was absolutely uh, uh, correct. Artistic title page. Uh, look at it. This is not every, do believe me, every rabbi, every yeshiva student up till today, if he sees this design, if, even if this is, would be omitted, he will say in a minute, immediately, this is the Vilna Shas. And um, the point is, we were wondering for some years, a few years, who designed it? Who was? And then we found, uh, in between, between you and me, she stole it from a book which was uh, printed in Italy by the early 18th century. They just, you know, <laughs> bought some copies of this book and they managed to copy it somehow. And uh, for, for so many Orthodox Jews nowadays, they consider this one as a sort of, you know, the uh, Jerusalem temple. <laughs> but, uh, well, one way or another, it, uh, it was of Italian origin. Uh, fine paper. She insisted of printing uh, this Babylonian Talmud on the best possible paper. However, there was a shortage of paper in the Russian Empire by this time. How could she get so, you know, so, so I mean, uh, amount of paper? Now we know the answer. She cooperated with a local, pub, with a local Polish publisher, and they both, again, between you and me, they bribed some officials, not only in Vilna, but also in St. Petersburg, which was the capital of the Russian Empire. And they got sort of, you know, unofficial permission to import uh, uh, a very fine paper, very exclusive paper from Germany. Obviously, th those officials got their share, but, um, you know, business is business. Uh, luxury branding, high pricing, as I say, script, a strict publishing timetable, time, time and please do remember, uh, well, not remember. During these years between 1880 and 1886, her stores, I mean the stores of these, you know, printed books, was burned down twice by her competitors, one from the Ukraine, one from Germany. Um, well, she took revenge, and I'm not going to get into details now, but what I mean is that still she managed to run a strict publishing timetable. And uh, um, this is again, you know, a way of managing, of running a business which is quite interesting. And effective distribution, um, for instance, once she published uh, an ad in one of these, uh, you know, newspapers, uh, saying that uh, uh, we know that we have a huge uh, constituency of, uh, of, uh, cons of uh, customers in the city of Odessa. Odessa is the port city of, in, in southern Ukraine. Now, between Vilna and Odessa, it's about 2,000 kilometers. So what was in this ad that uh, uh, in order not uh, to make it you know, such of a burden for our, for our customers in, in Odessa, the price of the Babylonian Talmud in, in Odessa and Vilna would be the same. What they didn't know, that a month earlier, she raised the price of this, you know, of this edition to cover you know, the, uh, the postage you know, uh, expenses. So this was the lady. This was uh, Deborah Rome. So here you see the title page. This, here you see the inner title page. And you see here written more than 100 you know, uh, uh, a new, edi new uh, um, um, editions, and uh, Vilna in the printing house, and the widow and the brother's son. But it, there is another word here. In Hebrew, bedfus vehotzaot. In English, by the printing and the expenses of uh, the widow and the brothers. And this is, again, a word which explains a lot, or says a lot. As I said beforehand, some Jewish, you know, very, later on, very well famous, you know, 
uh, authors, when they wanted to, uh, to uh, the, the manuscript to be published, they had, you know, uh, to uh, uh, finance it. Here, what she did, she used her own money, right? So that means bedfus vehotzaot, means that we financed we, uh, uh, this edition by ourselves. And they did not use what was known in those times, there's a very, uh, used to be very well known in Yiddish word, prenumeranten. Prenumeranten is uh, 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 um, subscribers. There's uh, a new uh, a version of this type of uh, marketing now in the, in, the, uh, in the internet. How do you call it? When you want you know, to publish something, so you uh, publish it and then people uh, buy, you know, uh, people pay you uh, in advance. And then when you uh, publish it, or, or it could be in, in the high tech business, then they got their own re reward. It was very common by this time. So if you wanted to publish a book and you do not have enough money, so you went with your, your, with your manuscript for one house to another, for one synagogue to another, convincing people to buy the f future edition in advance, then you got the money, then they went to this lady, and for instance, you know, you know who's the famous, one of the most famous? Abraham Mapu, the founding father of modern Jewish literature, Hebrew literature. He used the same system, and he came to her and said, uh, this is the money, please publish my Avat Zion and Ashmat Shomron and all you know, the, these very famous uh, books. But here, it's, it was her own money. And then it became so famous, so well known, Vilna Bedfusa Almana Ve'achim Rom. Here you see another one which is very interesting. Pay attention to this one. This edition was not published in Vilna. This edition was published in Jerusalem by the year 2016. But they still, you know, preserve the same design. Why? Because from the, you know, marketing point of view, even nowadays, among Orthodox Jewish circles, this is the best way to, you know, to sell the, the Babylonian Talmud. You see what's written here? Uh, in the form, it's a, yeah, Vilna, in the printing and publishing house of the widow and the brothers from, uh, in this year, but uh, you have to be very um, professional to understand which year. And then it's written here, the new Vilna Shas, the new Vilna Babylonian uh, Talmud. And it, it's very interesting. Um, I don't know where, whether I have here, no, no, I won't. You know, one of the uh, most, um, um, uh, um, one of the most popular editions of uh, the uh, Babylonian Talmud, which was printed and sold in Israel during the last 15 years, was by Rabbi, headed by Rabbi Adin Steinsatz. It's a new edition printed in uh, New Hebrew letters and so on and so forth. However, however, in Orthodox, obviously ultra-Orthodox, circles, they wouldn't buy it. Why? Because according to their understanding, and I, I talked to some of these people, they are sure that the Vilna Shas, the Vilna, I mean, this edition was given to Moses in Sinai. They use this term. So they, you can study only with this, you know, uh, sacred edition. And all of a sudden came, came another rabbi, and he, uh, you know, uh, um, printed a new edition, which is not sacred. So, uh, in the new edition of the, what is known as the Steinsaltz Shas, they pre it's printed, uh, I don't know, in double uh, uh, forms. One page is the modern one, and the other page is the Vilna Shas uh, uh, type. Now, it became sacred. So everybody can buy it and, uh, read it, and so on and so forth. So you see how, how, uh, how effective she was, or she is, up till today. Um, this is one example of, of the letters which we found in the archives. You see, uh, sorry, it's in uh, Russian. So uh, 
wdowa i brat Jarom, wdowa jest za the widow and brother Strom. Uh, they are uh, typographers and publishers and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is uh, 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 her or their, uh, um, oh, and, and this is sort of an um, official uh, publishing house. And this is a letter which was sent to one of the most famous, most important Jewish intellectuals and rabbis, by this time Solomon Buber, the grandfather of Martin Buber. Solomon Buber lived in Lemberg, in Lvov, by this time. And he, uh, he had, I mean, he uh, composed so many manuscripts, but he insisted of publishing his manuscripts only in the Rome printing house, which was far, far, far away from, from, from Lvov. And we have about 100 uh, exchange letters between him and her. And she was very strict. She uh, said to him, we, were, we, we very well appreciate your uh, scholarship and uh, manuscript and so on and so forth. However, these are my conditions. And if you wish, well, very well. If not, I mean, it's up to you. Look for another publisher. Now, he, was, he knew very well that if you publish a book in this printing and publishing house, it will be sold, you know, by so many uh, copies. If not, well, you take a risk. So uh, this is the signature, this is to Solomon Buber. And what is very interesting here, this is the letter, this is letter is in Hebrew, but what is very interesting is the signature. This is her own signature. That means that a Jewish lady in Eastern Europe, by this time, mastered Hebrew fluently. This is one example, there are quite many others, but according to the, um, well, I would say, the um, scholarship or the research regarding Jews in Eastern Europe, there is sort of, uh, you know, um, way of thought. The Jewish women by this time, they couldn't read and write, and they were not, uh, you know, learned and so on and so forth, which is uh, absolutely wrong, absolutely wrong. Obviously, ladies like Vororon, which grew up, you know, which was raised in a very affluent family, and obviously her father and mother employed some private teachers. But the entire uh, uh, um, 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 this negotiation between Deborah Rom and Solomon Buber are in Hebrew. It's written here at Mikhtavo Anichbad, right, right? Well, many and shlosh I mean. This is a, uh, as, um, basically or um, strictly a financial uh, negotiation between her and him. And you see here again her signature. Now the Rome family. A few words about the Rome family. I was talking about, you know, business and everything, but there was a family. Deborah Rome as I said, uh, was born to a, a well, very well-known and affluent uh, family known as Harkavi, the Harkavi family, and uh, her husband was uh, David Rome. For quite many time, we were trying, me, I mean we, I mean my, me and my research students together, we were trying to trace the footsteps of her sons and daughters because she, was, she uh, passed away by the year 1904. None of her children took upon themselves the business. The business was sold to, some, to someone else. I'm not going to uh, uh, elaborate uh, on it now. So we were curious about what happened to this family. And I was curious because uh, part of my research is uh, research of the uh, history of, of education. When you understand or when you um, notice which education a family or in which way a certain family educated her children, you can learn a lot or uh, study a lot about the cultural worldview of this family, and, which is obvious. Now here you see uh, three of her sons, of her sons, all of, none of them, this guy and this guy and this guy looks as orthodox Jews, do they? No. 
Uh, three of them, th these three, emigrated to America, already during her lifetime. This guy was a doctor. This guy was um, a devoted communist. Was born to the most capitalistic family, mm -hmm. right? And this guy, uh, he was a, 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 um, a scientist, a chemist. And still, you can, well, you can see that none of them is an Orthodox Jew, which means, which says something about uh, the uh, atmosphere in her own house. Please do remember, she was a widow. There wasn't a father in this house. Obviously, she employed the best possible uh, teachers, and uh, you know, which she could find, find but uh, still. Deborah Rohn passed away by the year 1904. First of all, this is her photo. We have just two photos of her. The one which you saw by the very beginning as a young lady, which I am not very much sure that this is her own photo. I must share it with you. Some others, you know, insist that it is her. I'm not sure, but this is obvious. And when you look, when you, uh, look at this figure, Try to look at her eyes. She is, she wasn't a very, um, I would say, I'm trying to find the correct word. I wouldn't say the word nice, but she was, she was a very strict, uh, she had a very strict character. And uh, let me give an example. Her, uh, one of her niece, uh, once came to Vilna, and he wanted to become and uh, from a near, nearby town, and her and his father uh, told him go to this uh, lady, and she uh, she's very rich and fluent, affluent, and she would em employ you. Okay, so she uh, uh, he sorry, he came to Vilna, and uh, knocked on the door of the building house and said, I am Mr. Harkavi, I am one of the family. I want to have an interview with uh, Deborah Rohn. So uh, he was asked to sit down. And then her secretary told him, fine, come back within a couple of weeks. She's busy. After a couple of weeks, he again knocked the door. And she, uh, uh, he was accepted. And then he, the interview uh, is very interesting. She was not uh, very keen of him. And she said, fine, fair enough. If you want to be part of the printing house family, fine. You start from the very bottom. But I mean, you what we say in, in Yiddish, you schlep. You carry those huge bulks of paper. And then you would work with the, you know, with the printing machines and so on and so forth. The fact that you are part of the family means nothing, I mean, regarding your uh, um, um, place in this publishing and, and printing house. So on the one hand, as I said, she was very considering regarding her employees. On the other hand, she was a strict businesswoman. Secondly, please pay attention, she never ever covered her hair. And this is an orthodox Jewish society. And so many people uh, wonder whether this is a wig or not. Well, it is not. And they secret behind it, and well, you know obviously that in ultra-Orthodox uh, circles up till today, a married woman wouldn't go out without her hair covered. It's um, part of tradition. The point is that among Lithuanian Jews, or as they are known, Litvaks, married women never covered their hair. So she was part of the family. I mean, she was part, but secondly, we should remember that one way or another, she um, could do whatever she wanted. Nobody would uh, tell her off. So if she wanted to go out without her cover, I mean, it was, uh, no. Yeah. I want to ask something about this uh, notice of oh, the funeral. Uh, yeah. Five minutes. Uh, yeah. It's quite amazing that uh, according to these, she was buried four days after she died. <laughs> she died on... Uh, Thursday, and she was buried on Sunday, yeah. and uh, which is not very uncommon in Jewish practice. You usually bury as soon as you can. 
and uh, the whole affair, it doesn't look specifically orthodox in any way, yes? Uh, it's <laughs> not very Jewish, I, I would say, except... Uh, and uh, must be very unique to this uh, person, because she was, I don't know, so famous that the whole, everybody, the whole country would have come to the to the funeral, so is that why they postponed it by several days, or no. you have other explanations? Okay. No explanation, but first of all, look at this notice, which is quite, you know, it was quite big, more or less this size, and it was posted all around the city, and we found the, uh, some uh, uh, protocol of the local police administration. And they, they knew that tens of thousands of people would, uh, you know, would uh, uh, join the funeral. But this is, this is not the reason why the funeral was postponed to Sunday. The reason was that according to the Russian law of this time, when somebody passed away, uh, you should have, the family had to wait for at least three days uh, until the burial. Why? Because they were not, I mean, they did not have, you know, a sort of a, all these scientific uh, uh, ways to make sure that the deceased is really dead. So it's in, uh, well, this, is, this was the, the, the Russian law. Now, she passed away by Thursday. The funeral could not take place on Shabbat. So it was postponed to Sunday. And by Sunday, we have, you know, some uh, memoirs, and people say that you couldn't go through the city. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. I mean, everybody was around, and the police, you know, blocked all the main streets, and so on and so forth. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in general, or to sum up, according to my understanding, and I must say that the research is, uh, it is what we call a research in progress. As I said, we have a research team uh, composed of uh, six uh, research, re research students, some from Israel, some from, from Germany. Um, we know quite a bit, quite a lot about Deborah Rome, but not enough. But, I mean, one, but there's one point which I'm quite sure about it. Deborah Rome, according to my understanding, was the most important cultural, Jewish cultural agent of the time. Please do remember that it was according to her to decide whether a certain book would be published or not. Now, th those of you who are familiar with modern Jewish literature, again, it was according to her to decide whether Mapu, Adama Kohen, Yalag, later on Berdichevsky, and some others would be pre uh, printed and published. So in a way, she formed the modern Jewish bookcase, which, com which was composed of uh, traditional Jewish literature, canonic Jewish literature, and modern Jewish literature. Set aside that she also printed a non-Jewish literature, and even, believe it or not, uh, a prayer books for the local churches, for the, Christian lo for, for, the, for the local Christian churches. There was a demand, and if there was a demand, somebody had to supply. And if it was profitable, she did it. So to sum up, she was not only, according to my understanding, a, pub a printer and publishing and marketing genius, she was, uh, well, you may agree with me or not, uh, one of the most important cultural agent of modern Jewish times. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was fascinating for me. Yeah, I think it's working. Maybe you cannot hear me well. Okay, now it's okay. Um, if there are any questions or remarks, yes, please. Okay, we have to stop here. Thank you very much, Professor Zalkin, for coming to Doshisha University. And we have learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you again for inviting me and for you all for coming this evening. <laughs>